Hi, today I'm going to be talking about lesson 9-5, the calculus of vector valued functions. This is really the first lesson of multivariable calculus, but it's the last lesson I'm teaching for BC this year. Um, BC does not really talk about multivariable functions, but this is the gateway to that. So if you're taking 252, multivariable calculus at any college, you'll see the continuation of this. And if you're an engineer, I can guarantee you'll be taking it. So basically the idea is we have parametric functions. Para functions. X of T and Y of T. And we're going to turn these into a vector valued function. And what does that mean? A vector valued function is a function where if I plug in time equals one, I'm getting a vector. So the idea here, the position vector, which will be called S of T, is going to equal the vector X of T comma Y of T. And that will give location of the object. It gives the location of the object at time t. So that's what I mean. So every single time, time equals one, time equals zero, we'll have a position. We'll have a vector position. So every single time will tell us not just the location of where the particle is, but its direction. Its direction at that instant. You'll see an example of this with numbers in a second. So what's the velocity function? If that's my position function, my velocity function, just like in um, AB, or normal motion, will be the derivative of the position functions, plural. So we'll still have the equation V of T equals S prime. Right? But what does that mean? I take the derivative of each component and then I plug in time. I'm going to take the derivative and then plug in time, not the other order. That will be bad. Acceleration vector will be the second derivative, just like it was before. So again, x is the x position, y is the y position, x prime is the x velocity, y prime is the y velocity, x double prime, the x acceleration, y double prime, the y acceleration. And we'll still have the equations, the differential equations, haha. Uh -huh. It's the second derivative of position, right? And that should be clear from this notation as well. I just want to make it abundantly clear. So then someone will ask you what the speed of a particle is. And the speed, which we'll always call speed, not s, because s will mean position, will be the absolute value of velocity. Not the absolute value, the magnitude of the velocity vector at that time. The magnitude of the velocity vector at that time. And how do I calculate magnitude? Well. I take the square of its x component plus the square of the y component. Look at my parentheses, make sure they match what you're doing. And I square root that whole thing. That'll be the magnitude of the velocity. The distance traveled, we're gonna have the total distance, I'll usually abbreviate it equals the integral from a to b, or time one to time two. Let's write it like that. Time one to time two of the speed. With respect to time. So just to be clear, that's the integral 
from T1 to T2 of V of T, dt, the same thing. Or if you want to remember it this way, of the speed function. So all three of these equations are the same exact thing as they are in one-dimensional motion. For motion in one dimension, the total distance traveled is the integral of the absolute value of velocity. In two dimensions or more, we don't really have an absolute value function. We have a modulus function. We have a way of getting the magnitude, the magnitude. And that's what absolute value is doing too. It's going to use the magnitude. Okay, let me shrink that so I can fit the next one. Ta-da. Okay. At rest. This is the number one thing my Del Norte students struggle with. We're talking about V of T equals 0, comma, 0. Both the X component and the Y component have to be 0 for, your, for you to be at rest. So for instance, a common, a common example is a cannon. I don't know if that looks like a cannon to you, but is a cannon that shoots a cannonball. Okay? When we throw the cannonball, when we shoot the cannonball, at this point, y prime equals zero because that's the maximum point. That's where the velocity in the y direction will change from increasing, sorry, the velocity in the y will change from a positive to a negative. The y position will change from increasing to decreasing. So y prime is zero at that point. But x prime is never zero during the whole flight of the cannonball. Even at this position, the ball is not at rest. The ball is at rest in the y component, we could say, but the ball is not at rest because it will still be moving toward the right. So make sure you check that x is zero and y is zero. The x velocity is zero and the y velocity is zero. They both need to be zero. It's possible for it never to be at rest, okay? That's possible because they might disagree one might be zero at one time, the other will be zero at another time. It has to be zero at the same time. When you plug in the time value, you get zero in both components. I can't say this in more different ways, okay. So we're given this position vector, S of T, and the particle is gonna move in the XY plane. Graph the particle on the interval of zero to two. So the way I'm going to do that is pretty simple. I'm going to check, this is S, right? S of T. I'm going to check S of zero. S of zero equals the vector zero comma four. I plug in zero everywhere I see T. S of one equals three comma two. You don't even have to write the what I'm writing here. S of two equals twelve, wow, comma eight minus twelve plus four zero. So that's pretty special. So the idea is as time flows, if you want to rewatch parametric motion, that might be helpful here, but as time flows, I'm going from here through that blue point all the way down to the green point, probably in a smooth way. I'm drawing this function as smooth as possible. And just like with parametric, I have an orientation. I'm not drawing the vectors here. I'm drawing just the fact that this has a nice flow to it. My particle is flying this way until it grounds out at time two. 
okay? So this is telling me about the position of the particle on that interval, okay? Now, if you get confused, I see a lot of students do this, a lot of students just start plugging in and they graph two lines or two curves. That's not okay. You graph, you graph multiple, not multiple, you graph one curve. You graph one curve, never two curves. Okay. I'm gonna erase this. Again, you won't need to show that. I'm just plugging in points. And there was a progression from red to blue to green. Time one, time zero, time one, time two. Just plugging in the numbers that are easy. The velocity vector at that time. Okay, so if someone asked me about the velocity vector, if that's the speed vector, then the velocity vector will equal the derivative in the x direction, which will be four, nope, shoot, 12t, 6t, wow, I'm really flubbing, 6t. The derivative in the y direction, 3t squared minus 6t. That's the velocity vector. And you want to make sure you take the derivative, then plug in 1. Not ever in the other order. So v of 1 equals 6, comma, 3, minus 6. So velocity in the x direction is positive, moving to the right. Velocity in the y direction is negative, moving down. And then we can find the speed of the particle at time t. So the speed of 1 equals the magnitude of v of 1. Now again, you don't need to use this equation, or for the first time. I don't need to use this equation all the time. I have v of 1 right here. So that equals the square root of 6 squared plus negative 3 squared which equals 36 plus 9, root 45, which is 3 comma 5, or 3 root 5. On the AP test, you could obviously stop there. That's a numerical value for speed. Speed will always be positive. It's the magnitude of a vector. How fast is it going? It's going 50 miles per hour. I don't care about the direction. Whereas velocity is like, oh, it's going six miles per hour north, sorry, east, and three miles per hour south, okay? The distance traveled between zero and three. And again, for points, this is what's going to give you credit. Total distance equals the interval from zero to three, and I'm gonna write the velocity, the speed function in this case. The square of x prime plus the square of y prime with respect to time. I'm talking about this equation for speed. When you type that in your calculator carefully, as I learned in the 9-4 video, this, the one I have on the computer is not good for this. You should get 28.583. Gonna have to watch out for units. I guarantee this will be on the free response section. The times when the particle is at rest. Okay, I'm interested in V of T being 0, comma 0. V of T being 6T, comma 3T squared minus 6T equals zero comma zero. I'm sorry. So I want 6t equals zero and percent ah, and 3t squared minus 6t equals zero. This one's t equals zero and this one would be t equals zero comma two. So only at time equals zero. Not at time equals two. Because when we're going time equals two, the velocity in the x direction is gonna be 12. 
So it's not still, it's moving 12 meters per second or whatever you want to say. It's pretty fast. Now, now, one other way to do this is to solve the simpler one and plug into the more complicated one. Because sometimes you will only get one zero and you don't want to have to find the zeros of this guy. You just want to verify that the zeros over here are zeros over here. Okay? That's one tip for your homework. Acceleration vector at time two. A of t equals six comma derivative in the x direction, six t minus six, the derivative in the y direction. Again, I'm taking the derivative, then plugging in two. I plug in two to the function six and I get six. A lot of students, a lot of your peers will write two there. Be careful. And I get six. So at times two at time two, it's accelerating six in the x direction and six in the y direction. Direction of the particle. Direction. If you remember lesson nine dash four, theta equals arctan y over x, right? So we need position vector. We need S -X, the original guy. S of 1. I'm using this vector. I'm using this vector. 3 comma 1 minus 3 plus 4. 2. Theta equals arctan. 2 comma 2 over 3. Sorry. It's a calculator thing. I guarantee you this will be on the calculator portion of the FRQ almost every single year. 0.588 radians. They ask you units. S of 2, on the other hand, would be. 12 in the x, 8 minus 12 plus 4, 0 in the y. So theta in this case would equal arctan 0 over 12, which is arctan of 0, just to make the point really clear that this is not a calculator question. You need to know arctan of 0 because you know tan of 0 is what? 0. So what angle in tan would make zero? Zero. So if you go back to look at the flight of this particle, oh, if you go back to look at the flight of this particle, you see at that time, there, that's why the direction is zero. It's right at the y-axis. It's about to bounce off. Its direction vector at that time is zero. Whereas its direction vector at time this time is an angle pointing from the origin to that. That's why it's a positive half about. So as I mentioned in class, some of you, I've had to record example two three or four times now. That's why there is such an awkward cut there. It's OK. So example two is trying to say, just like how we can go from position to velocity to acceleration with vectors. We can also go from acceleration to velocity to position with vectors. The same thing was true in one dimensional motion and now it's going to be true in three in two dimensional or spoiler alert three dimensional motion. So we start by looking at this particle that's moving in the x y plane as opposed to just the x or the y axis and here's its acceleration vector. So if that's the acceleration vector, and they're asking me for the velocity vector, as always, just like in one directional motion, the velocity at time t is still equal to the integral of the acceleration at time t with respect to t. So we're going to use the same technique to integrate both the x component of the acceleration and the y component of the acceleration. 
what I'm saying is, therefore, the velocity vector would be equal to, and I'm only going to write this to make it really clear. Normally, I would just integrate that in my head. 2 cosine t dt and the integral of negative 3 sine t. So we're going to do both the integral of the x component and the integral of the y component. Now, this is cosine. Integral of cosine is sine. Make sure you keep the angular brackets. Make sure you don't forget to add c. And I'm actually going to call this c1 because it's very <clears throat> likely, cough, 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 that we'll have more than one c. Spoiler alert. Now the integral of co uh, sine is negative cosine. Negative cosine times negative 3 is positive 3 cosine. Cost plus c2. Oh, look at that. It's like I can predict the future. Um, so now it comes time when we can use this information. At time 0, its velocity vector v of 0 equals 0, 3. So v of 0 equals this also. Negative 2 sine 0 plus c1 comma 3 cosine 0. And it rarely comes up in class, but without the parentheses, sine just sort of takes whatever's next to it and then never anything beyond a plus. We only really have to use the parentheses if we want to have x plus 5 be the argument of sine. If it makes you feel better, you can always put the parentheses, but the idea is, again, the parentheses are only grabbing the t, not the c. Okay, now v of 0 is also equal to 0, comma, 3. Sine of 0 is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. And now you might notice that there's a system of equations going on here. Um, you don't have to think about it that way. You can just reason it out. I'm sorry. I don't know how I hit that. So C1 must be 0. The first component must match the, sec the first component here. The second component must match the second component here. And in fact, therefore, C2 must also be 0. So putting it all together, my actual velocity vector at any given time t is negative 2 sine t sine of t, technically comma, 3, cosine of 2. Which is exactly what it says up here, right? Except now C2 and C1 are both known to be 0. So this is the velocity vector. Now I'm going to shrink that. It's important as we prepare for the AP test that you pay attention continually to what the question asks you. I've been mentioning this all year, that... The nature of calculus is such that in any other class, this may have been the end of the problem. We found something. We did a lot of work. That could have been the end of a problem. That could feel like a achievement. And then this feels like a bigger achievement. But you have to return to the question that was being asked. Find the velocity vector when t equals pi over 4. Oh, shucks. We have to do one more thing. So, I guess I'll just use... Hot pitch though. No. V of pi over 4. That's one ugly pi. Equals, and again, just to drive this point home, negative 2 sine of pi over 4, comma, 3 cosine pi over 4. And here's why trig is so very, very important. Now, if it was a free response, yes, you could leave it like that. That would be fine. But we should be a little more accurate. Because we know our trig, right? Right. Right. No. Now, 
sine of pi over 4 is square root of 2 over 2. So times negative 2 gives us negative square root 2. Cosine of pi over 4 is also root 2 over 2. That's why pi over 4 is so special. 3 root 2 over 2. Beautiful. And that will be our final answer. And again, there's nothing wrong with this being your final answer if you're a free response. But my tests would say something like simplify. So be ready for that. Now, on to the other one. They want the position vector at this time. It's the same basic idea that the position vector s, and remember not to ever use s for speed. S is not speed, S is not speed, S is not speed, S is position. It would be the integral of the velocity vector. So as an initial thing, and here I'm not going to write out the integral inside because it's a little bit of a sloppy notation. I'm just going to integrate that. I'm just going to integrate each component here. So the x component of position would be, what's the integral of sine? Negative cosine. So 2 cosine t. Sorry, that's really ugly. Okay. Let me do that. 3 cos 2 cosine t. And the integral of cosine t. Ah, I almost forgot it. Plus c. And now this is the third c we've written. It's important to distinguish these with subscripts. You can lose points. Um, and then the y position vector should be 3 sine t. Now, just to emphasize that these are the x component and the y component, I'm going to do the rest of this problem using that fact. Um, so with the position vector equal to this, this is a posi ah, this is a parametric equation. This is a parametric equation which says that the x position at any given time is 2 cosine t plus c1. Oh man, plus c3. And that the y position vector, the y position, not vector, the y position of the particle is given by this equation. So, now I can use this initial position to solve these. So, at time 0, the x initial position is 2. And at time 0, the y initial position is root 2 over 2. And that's not as nice as we might hope, but it's what it is. And again, I know these both are times zero because it's a zero inside. They can give you an initial position of one or three or a million bajillion. Two cosine zero is two. Solve it, we would get C three equals zero. Yay. Three sine of zero is zero. C4 is root 2 over 2. Ugly, ugly, ugly. But it's okay. We won't judge it too harshly. Now, x of t is officially, now that we've solved the constant, 2 cosine t. And y of t is officially its constant, 3 sine t. Plus, C4, uh, plus root 2 over 2, which is the value of C4. Good? Good. Now, again, this is a functional notation. This is the parametric version of this function, or the parameterization of this function. I can, again, recombine S of T is... So you have some fluency here. Now if they ask you for a vector, you need to give them the vector at the end of the day. And if any of you were thinking that I forgot that it says position at time t 
equals pi over 4. I haven't. I'm getting it back into vector form. So s of pi over 4. I should use a different color. Let's use purple. And in class, you guys always argue with me that this isn't purple. And I probably talked about this in other videos too, because it's a big pet peeve of mine. Because you see how on my screen, it definitely looks purple. And this definitely looks like a dark blue. In class, because of the board's, I don't know, resolution? Question mark? They both look purple. 2 cosine pi over 4. 3 sine pi over 4. Plus root 2 over 2. And again, if it didn't say simplify, you could stop there. If it was not if it was not the multiple choice portion, you could stop there. But as you'll see, sometimes these questions come up in multiple choice. In fact, quite a lot, they come up in multiple choice. So let's just simplify. And you know, these are nice angles. Cosine of pi over 4 is still root 2 over 2. We're talking about over here. So this is root 2. 3 sine pi over 4. Sine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2, 3 root 2 over 2, plus 1 root 2 over 2 is 4 root 2 over 2, or 2 root 2. I'll just put a little intermediate step here. It's like 3 root 2 over 2 plus root 2 over 2. So, if you're good with fractions, which you all should be, you should see how this adds to 4 root 2 over 2, which is 2 root 2. S position, velocity, okay? Okay. Find the speed when t equals pi over 4. So as I mentioned on the very first slide in this lecture, speed at pi over 4 would be given by the magnitude of the velocity at pi over 4. And again, this is the same as one directional motion. This is the same idea as one directional motion. And what does this magnitude notation mean? It would be the magnitude of the x direction of speed and the y direction of speed added together. Just in case you are too lazy to rewind, we're talking about this equation. Now, guys, You should not be sitting there thinking that you have to compute these derivatives. This is the formal equation for it. Connell, in class that day, kept saying, like, oh, we should do it this way. That's the formal equation. But guess what? We already know. We already know what x prime is. We already know what y prime is. We already know what they are even at that time. Even at that time. So there's no need to compute it this way. There's no need to compute it this way. Rather, the speed at pi over 4, and for you guys it's like right above it, so it's really easy to see. It should be we're squaring the x component of the velocity which is just negative 2. Sorry, negative root 2. Plus the y component of the velocity, which was 3 root 2 over 2. Okie dokie. Again, you could leave that. That's a number. But you should all be braver than that. Not uh, 2. 2 plus, how does this work? 9 fourths times 2. Square this, square this, square that. 9 fourths times 2 is 9 halves. Or, and this is not really any better, so I don't really care where you stopped here. But this is the final answer I would give, because I'm strong with my arithmetic. There's no shame in being weak with the arithmetic and getting a 5. 
Okay, here we go. The times and the particles at rest. So we need need the x velocity and the y velocity equals zero. Okay. So what was the x velocity? The x velocity is negative two sine t. At the same time, three cosine t equals zero. There's not really good notation for this x velocity, y velocity stuff. So make sure you're familiar. Make sure you're not getting confused sitting there when I'm saying, oh, x velocity, y velocity. That's what these mean in this case. They don't always mean velocity. If you're asked to interpret questions about derivatives on the test, and you say x velocity and y velocity, you might not get the right answer. You might not get the full points to talk about velocity when velocity is not the right context for the rate. The rate of position is velocity. And these are both positions in this case. And so I'm not sitting there taking the derivative of this function to find this function. I just know it because we already found the velocity vector. Enough said. So when is this true? When is sine t equals zero? That's really your question. That would be for t equals, well, sine t is zero when t is zero, pi, two pi, three pi, and so on. Cosine of t is zero, on the other hand, when we have t equals pi over two, three pi over two, four pi over two, I almost said four pi over two, five pi over two, seven pi over two, and basically what I'm saying, basically what we're seeing here, if you know this, and you need to know this, you need to know trig that well, and polar the lessons on 9.2, the 9.3, should have made you feel, oh, I really need to know trig. Anyway, so we need these two to be both zero at the same time. At same time. Because some students just write all of these down in one big list. That's not right. Whenever this, whenever it will be at rest in the x direction, it will not be at rest in the y direction. So the particle will never be at rest. And that's a possibility. Because sometimes these don't agree. We're looking for agreement here, and there's no agreement. We just are stuck with it might have stopped moving along the x-axis, but it kept moving along the y. Right, like our cannonball earlier. This, uh, this is the time when the particle is at rest in the y direction, but it is not at rest in the x direction. It is still moving. This cannonball is still moving at that point in the arc. Direction of the particle. Now, at this point, Kintaro has complained to me and said something very similar to how I feel. It's weird that direction is sort of the vector from the origin, the at angle from the origin. It's not the direction the particle is moving. It's the direction of the particle. It's that if we are at the x-axis, sorry, not just at the x-axis, if we are at the origin... Where is the particle in relation to us? At what direction from the origin is, up, is the particle? Right? That's what direction is asking. Direction moving is still similar. Is still similar to the other questions of which way is the particle moving? 
Which way is this particle moving? Down and, sorry, oof, x direction, x direction, x direction. Left, because velocity is negative and the x component, the x component of velocity is negative. And up, because the y component of velocity is positive. So, how do we find this? How do we find the actual direction of the particle? The direction theta is arctan of the y over the x. So theta at pi over 4 should be arctan y of pi over 4, which we had found to be 2 root 2. over x at pi over 4, which is root 2. And if I was really being pedantic with my notation, oh. this is theta evaluated at t equals pi over 4, right? I'm evaluating this theta function. So, what's that? That's arctan of 2. And, I don't know, I have the value, but I'm going to go over this one more time just for good measure. Look at that pretty graph. Arctan, second, tan, two. 1.107. And just to be clear, this is a number. This is a number. So if you were on a non-calculator portion, that's what you'd be expected to leave. Don't sit there and try to guess what arctan of 2 is. You don't know that. I don't know that. Nobody knows that. Distance traveled. The total distance traveled. So this should make you think of arc length. For parametric equations, it should make you think of arc length. For parametrics was a to b square root. And again, x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared. And I can't write today. Uh, dt. That's the same, it's the same exact thing as the total distance formula for vectors. And that should make you, you know, think, like we said. Why is it the same? Because if I'm measuring the curve, the length of a curve, I'm measuring how far the particle moved along that curve, right? If I have a mountain, looks like a parabola. If I have a mountain, measuring how long it is from here, how long of a walk it is from here to here, is measuring how far did someone walk if they walked from here to here, right? That's the same question, just phrased differently. Okay, so in this case, A is 0, B is 2, you would type this whole function into your calculator, x prime, again, do not sit there taking the derivative of x, of t, you don't need to, it's right here, it's the x component of velocity. negative 2 sine t plus 3 cosine t squared. And that's how you should type in your calculator. Go ahead and type it in. Again, this calculator is bad. It's not good for integration. It makes it look ugly. You should get 4.856. And then you'd have to think about whatever units.
if they gave you units. So that's it. That is it for Calculus BC. If you've watched all of these videos, you have learned all of the BC topics. Um, congratulations. Congratulations. I should have said if you watched all the videos and did all the homeworks, you've learned all the topics. And congratulations for that. There are two homeworks after 9-5. There's 9-5, the doi, and then there's the homework 9-6 which is the only time the BC students got a review assignment all year. So, you know, honor that. Use that assignment with uh, wisdom. And I'm saying again, if you haven't been doing all the assignments, all the assignments from 6-1 all the way till 9-6, you are not understanding things. There's a bunch of stuff that the homework does for you that are not is not done in this lecture. So please make sure you do the homework. I hope you've left a little time for review because there's a bunch of stuff I would like to have done with you in class, but we'll see what happens. I'm recording this in the first day of spring break, so I don't really know how April's going to go. But I wish you the best of luck. I appreciate all the time you've spent watching these videos. And I'll talk to you soon.